Man, we picked a bad day to film. Yeah, she's a little bit of a blizzard out there. Welcome to Alberta. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Dad, last episode we talked a little bit about how farmers are really optimistic people and how maybe if I'm a parent raising a kid, maybe I should consider being optimistic too. Oh, I wow. So we're, buy we're that. agreeing on something? Oh, no, 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 we're not agreeing. Oh. No, I mean, farmers are optimistic about the job they're doing fair, but in in feeding more people, we've had more people now to feed, and I wonder if that doesn't have a really negative impact on the environment and on the technology that farmers have to use. I don't, I don't know So, so we're supposed to meet the needs of the planet by feeding people, but not use our land and, and technology to do it. Well, I don't know if that's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> Nick, I don't know that you know what you're saying. Hi, my name is Nick Syke, and lately, I've had some questions surrounding what's true about our food. My dad's a baby boomer who grew up on a farm, and he's worked in agriculture all of his life. Understanding each other isn't easy at the best of times, and when it comes to food, we need science as a common language if we're going to make any sense of the other's point of view. And that's the goal. Join me while I annoy this guy with my skepticism as we search for the answers to my questions about our food. Welcome to Learn GMO. As a filmmaker, I've spent insane amounts of time staring through a camera at this. Modern farming takes controlling nature as far as possible. Big fields, big equipment, chemical fertilizer, modified seed. These are all the things it takes for modern farmers to farm. And it makes me wonder if maybe the way my grandpa farmed, smaller equipment, smaller fields, less chemical fertilizer, no modified seed, Maybe that way it was better? You cannot deny that the way that Grandpa farmed was way more natural than the way we farm now. Way more natural? Yeah. Oh my God, Nick, you are so far in left field. In my experience, when Rob mentions the left in association with me, it's usually leading to an argument. I can't, okay, so now you're getting me mad. So I'm gonna, we're gonna, you know what I'm gonna do? Told you. We're gonna call Jeff. I'd love to go see Let, Jeff. Yeah, you're gonna see Jeff. Okay. Jeff is a potato farmer near us in Alberta. His family, the Eccles, grow seed potatoes for other farmers to plant. If you've eaten a McCain fry or a McDonald's hash brown, you may have eaten the offspring of potatoes grown on the Eccles farm. Hey Jeff. Hey Rob. <laughs> How's it going today? Yeah. Nice day, but don't show. Let's see you yeah. next day. <laughs> Here's what I'm gonna ask Jeff. Farmers have done a pretty good job of keeping people fed. Now there's more of us to feed. So they have to keep doing more and more and more, and I wonder if all of that progress is sustainable. Or are we slowly reducing the quality of our land? I don't gain anything by, you know, re reducing my land quality. How, how's my my sons or daughters going to be able to farm? Your gift to the next generation. Well, this land, right? Like our, our farm is, is meant to continue on, and it's the land. And and we know without good soil, we're, we've got nothing. Yeah. And we're going to do everything in our power to continue to, you know, improve that. We all want to do right by our kids. To Jeff, that means passing on a healthy business as well as a healthy place to live. I guess it makes sense that the quality of the land is sort of his top priority. So much rides on the land's ability to produce food. Another farming friend of mine, Terry Aberhart, can speak to that. You know, especially here in North America, we live in a very uh, advanced world of technology and, and have so much abundance. Of, of resources and, and our lifestyle living that, you know, maybe we get disconnected from that a bit or the general public does, but at the end of the day, all the farmers that I work with and know, including ourselves, are really producing food, what we feel is in the most sustainable manner to help, you know, feed feed the world and, and, and all, the, all the people that need to eat out there, which is essentially everyone in existence. Pretty high-minded, but when I was in Missouri, Jim Haney added a more practical angle to this conversation. If every time we turn that sprayer on, we're spending money. And farmers don't like to spend money. But just like any other businessman, they, they, they want to conserve as much as they possibly can. However, when we can go out there and we can spray something that we know is going to be, number one, environmentally friendly, number two, do a good job and a successful job, then we feel good a lot, or we will feel a lot better 
about going out there and doing that job for the day. So that's three different farmers with three different reasons they strive to be sustainable. But even all this feels like too little too late when we have so many people. So are we screwed or aren't we? This is Learn GMO. Turns out people have been losing sleep over that question for most of human history. And where better to learn about history than your local library? So I did the antique version of Googling. I don't know how libraries work. And I found the book I was looking for. It's called The Population Bomb, and it was written in the late 60s by a biologist named Paul Ehrlich. Here's the deal. The first half of the last century was really bad for food security. The global population was increasing on a very shaky food supply, leading people like Paul Ehrlich to some pretty dire conclusions. When Paul Ehrlich looked to the future, it just didn't look that good. First sentence of the book. The battle to feed humanity is over. In the 1970s and 80s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. Mr. Ehrlich saw an explosion coming, and I don't blame him. This book was written in the middle of the Cold War and a global food crisis. I can sit here with 50 years of historical context and say that none of Paul Ehrlich's predictions came true, but why is that? Well, if you, think, if you think about it, if you listen to what guys like Paul Ehrlich wrote in his book, you know, to sell his books and his speeches and his theories, the reality we would have been doomed in the 70s, which means you would not have been here. And I am here. Yeah, you're here because of people like Jeff, or farmers, and people like Norman Borla. Norman Borla, Jeff? Well, oh, he's, uh, <laughs> he helped with the Green Revolution, and we've produced how much more food because of him? Well, Norman Borlaug, Nick, Norman Borlaug, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner saved billions of people. Okay, cut. You said billions, not millions. We no, 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 no. I, I mean billions. He saved billions of people. Billions? You need to look this up. Jeff, billions? Yeah, if we weren't, it's more, more than millions. It's billions. Yeah. Rob's right about Norman. Probably a good thing, though, especially if you're one of the billion. Norman crossbred different types of wheat to make them yield more and resist disease. Working against the clock, he moved from the U.S. to Mexico to get two growing cycles per year. A side effect of Norman's arrival is that Mexico went from importing wheat to exporting wheat. Then when famine struck in India, Norman put his wheat to work there too. One of Norman's most famous quotes encapsulates the attitude of pretty much every farmer I've ever talked to. Don't tell me what can't be done. Tell me what needs to be done and let me do it. Now obviously I'm careful about making Rob's point for him but Norman Borleg fed a billion people. That kind of makes him a superhero, doesn't it? When you consider uh, Paul Ehrlich's pessimistic quote versus Norman Borlaug's optimistic quote, like, like rationalize that for me. Why would you take the pessimistic side? Uh, well, because I feel like Norman Borlaug's quote could have a qualifier. I think it could say like, by any means necessary, do what needs to be done. You can't get something from nothing. Modern crops like Norman's super-powered wheat need lots of nutrients from the soil, so farmers need powerful fertilizer to replenish the soil. And that powerful fertilizer has to come from somewhere. Haber-Bosch is a process that takes the nutrients from our air and converts them into fertilizer for plants. But my understanding is this requires a lot of energy, which means burning carbon, which means pollution. You can't get something for nothing. Well, if we, if farmers don't want to waste the resources, and yes, around the planet, yes, some nitrogen is wasted, but Jeff, on your farm, you guys have no interest in wasting nitrogen? No, it, nitrogen isn't, uh, it, it isn't like it's free, right? Like, yeah, it's in the air free, but we still have to pay for it, so. It's ridiculous to think farmers want to spend more money on fertilizer. Nitrogen fertilizer is crucial to the health of human beings on the planet. It's estimated that 50% of the protein every single human being comes from fertilizer. This is verified, and that means, as a species, we rely on these systems, like it or not. Maintaining land quality, producing food sustainably, and watching the bottom line means farmers have more incentives to do a good job than I would have assumed. There's not enough animal fertilizer for us to all go organic, so my view is that genetic engineering may provide a solution in the future for us to use nitrogen and other fertilizers more efficiently through genetic engineering. Hmm. So what you're both saying basically is, is don't knock the tools that farmers have. Yeah, I, we need these tools. We can, we can be better stewards of the environment if we have more tools to do those. 
I can agree that this system of high yielding plants and powerful fertilizers has kept a lot of people fed, fine. But I'm also seeing how this intensive kind of farming could lead some people to an alternative, more organic approach. I learned quite a bit, uh, but I still, have I still have tons of questions. Well, yeah, what? Like what? Okay, well, if modern farming is essentially giving the thumbs up to a any tool to make the job go better, which I get, like, you know, fertilizer, chemical, chemical. all that, all that jazz, is that, is that not what started the organic movement to be a counterpoint to all of that? And if I want to support farming that has no impact, can I just keep eating organic? So what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, like, not to knock Dorman Borlake, like, I'm glad, I'm glad that his system of farming saved a billion lives, that's great, but can't I support organic farming if I want to support a kind of farming that has, like, no chemical, no fertilizer? <laughs> now you're starting to piss me off. Really, you think that organic farming has no impact on the environment. You've got a lot to learn. Okay, I'm sensing another raw brand coming on. Yeah, here. there's a raw brand coming on. Okay, here well, because hold you on, are hold on, hold so on. So much into We're the, gonna the save propaganda, this. the or organic propaganda, the organic industry propaganda. Like I'm going to use the word organic industry propaganda. I'd like to save this for the next episode. Can you hold it in? <laughs> it's good. It's going to be hard to hold it well, in because there's a lot that you have to learn. Welcome to Learn GMO. 